vision What's going on everyone? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Dead on Dave. I got a little bit of a different show for you today. Um, most of you guys know by now that I am a medically retired United States Army member. I got hurt in Iraq during my uh, second tour and I just wanted to share a little story about 9-11 considering you know today is the 14 year anniversary of a day that for many people really changed the way the world works. I mean, it. It. This is an event that shattered world views for a lot of Americans. Uh, it still is a hotly debated subject. It, it's changed quite literally many people's way of lives for the better and for the worse. You know, some people. What I mean by for the better, for some people, they became better Americans that day. They became more proud that day, and some never let it go. Others put a couple flags on their cars for a few months and then quickly forgot. Um, I have an interesting story about my September 11th experience. Uh, you see, it was 2001, obviously. It was uh, <laughs> on July 9th, 2001, I left my home of Las Vegas, Nevada and joined the United States Army. I was in basic training. Uh, we were about a little more than halfway through when uh, one morning in September we got on buses and went out to a practice range that was going to be a, a two-night affair. It was uh, known as Nick at Night in the Army. For those of my service member brethren, brethren who uh, went to basic training to know exactly what I'm talking about, it's this day-night course that you go through that tests all these things that you learned while you were in there. It's it's a fairly big deal. I don't even know if they still do it, to be completely honest. But it's a fairly big deal. A lot of people talk about it because it was, it's it's a big deal when you're hit when you're in basic. It's like everybody's talking about when's Nick at night, when's Nick at night, and all this stuff. So we go out there and we get on the bus, and you know the bus driver's not reacting any weird or anything, but we're riding out to the range usually we'd march but this was actually a little bit farther than your normal range and we're sitting there and the bus driver turns on the radio which is a rarity in itself every now and then we would have bus drivers who would do that but not all the time and we just hear about some tragedy where every like everyone starts being quiet like at first the people heard the the announcer on the radio talking about you know something happening and then more shushes and more shushes and everybody's shushing and it's talking about a tower one of the twin towers just went down and all this stuff so drill sergeant goes up to the front of the bus turns off the radio we continue to go out to the range and everybody's talking and nobody's sure if it was a training exercise we thought it was fake we thought like nobody thought what what we heard happen on the radio happened. You know, we thought it was like a training thing because the bus driver never turns on the radio ever. Like it's so rare for that to happen. So we get out there and we're, we're sitting down and we're doing our exercises and, but whispers are happening and the drill sergeants are kind of rushing around and being different. Everything feels different. We thought it was like a training exercise for readiness and all that, you know, like all this snickering is going on. Nobody's quite sure what's happening, but we're st this is in South Carolina, by the way. This is Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And we start noticing that certain people are getting pulled out of formations and pulled out of training to get talked to. And it doesn't take us very long to start figuring out that these people are folks who live in New York City. And every person who got pulled out by a drill instructor came back to their position white as a sheet you know some didn't come back some got on a bus and went back to uh the barracks and that's when we started knowing something happened and everyone's freaking out like uh, anyone who's not from new york is like starting to freak out at this point because now we know something happened and then when it really got real for us was when the drill sergeant called everyone back to get in formation and we got on the bus 
and we went back to the rear. We went back to the barracks. We went back to our, you know, to, to our home, basically. You know, we went back to the barracks, and we're sitting there, and uh, they brought us into a room and hooked up a television, which, you know, for six weeks or whatever, five weeks, however long we were there at the time, we ain't seen a television. You know, so <laughs> they put on the TV, and, you know, the girl sergeant can't even speak. Yeah, he, he can't even talk at all. And he was this big Samoan guy. Unfortunately, I can't remember his name. Stroke brain. And he uh, barely can open his mouth. And he's talking about something happened in New York. And, and he just turned on TV. And then we see all of this destruction. We see all this mayhem. We we see people crying. We, we see what happened. We see that both towers were knocked down and then the in pittsburgh or pennsylvania the uh the, the plane uh it was just all this stuff and people were getting sent home to new york people were you know just completely messed up nobody knew what to do uh, we lost i want to say five people washed out uh meaning they went to their Basically, you know, they went to the drill instructor, they went to the first sergeant, they went to the chaplain and said, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, I, I can't do this. And they got out. And there was no, usually when you wash out, there's they'll put you in a, in another, um, another platoon, another company, actually, another company, to where you're just... You do rear D, you do, you do uh, all kinds of shit details and stuff as you're processing out. These people didn't even do that. They were just, it was the fastest washout we'd ever seen, you know, all these people. It was like five from my company. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm wondering, should I stay in? Because regardless of any of the talks that everyone was having around, you know, sitting around as we're all talking... Going, hey, you think uh, you think we're gonna get fast tracked and go to Iraq? You know that was the that was the rumor. You know everybody's talking like we're gonna get fast tracked. We're going to Iraq, and I I remember saying, should I should I go home? You know I I signed up for the army, and I'm not look. I wasn't the most patriotic person in the world. I lo I've always loved my country, but I didn't join for some patriotic reason. You know I joined because. I needed a break from real life. You know, I, I had the next 20 years of my life planned out. Basically, I was going to go to college. I was going to marry my girlfriend, all of this stuff. And I was like, you know what? I want to go travel. I wanted to go to Germany. That was my big thing. I wanted to go to Germany. I wanted to get some life experience. I wanted to, you know, stuff like that. So I joined the military. It was, it seemed like a really good way. And I did, a, I signed up for three years knowing that they technically own you for eight, but I signed up for three years and I'm sitting there in basic training now after this news that basically everything has just been changed. The rules have been completely altered. The first time in history we've been attacked like that on that massive a scale on our own soil that wasn't just like Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. This is the continental United States. First time anything like this has ever really happened to this extent. And so I'm like... Should I just, should I pack it up, man? I Am I, how do I feel about this? I had to really assess everything of who I was at 18 years old. I had to figure out what type of man I wanted to be. And for about two seconds, I thought about going home. I did. I can't even lie. But I remember seeing two people that I had gotten relatively close to leave, to wash out. And I go, I am not that. Because regardless of their reasons regardless of their reasons, I just felt, I, I felt shame for them. You know, it was just like, I didn't pity them. I wasn't mad at them. I wasn't embarrassed. I just, I was, it, it was just this, like, I could feel th that they felt everybody's eyes on them. And I knew the conversations that they were going to have with their parents and their friends for the rest of their lives, whether or not they believed in what they were doing or whatever, it's something that was going to be a conversation piece for them for the rest of their lives. And I, for some reason, just gravitated to that. And I was like, I am not going to be that guy. That's not who I'm going to be. So I stayed in and 
a week later, we start getting duty assignments. And I find I'm going like to a rapid deployment duty station in Germany. It's like the worst. New no, I'm sorry. That's a lie. Because we got, I didn't get that. I didn't find that out until AIT. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. AIT is advanced training. Yeah, I was, that was Fort Gordon. So, yeah, it was much longer I found that out. But So I go to Georgia, and I find out that I'm going to bomb holder. And I'm just like, well, damn. <laughs> we really, there was no big scuffle yet at that point. Like, we haven't really entered anywhere or anything. Uh, so I go to bomb holder, and I meet this German lady. I knock her up. <laughs> A couple days later, I find out I'm going to Iraq. Uh, in like three weeks, rapid deployment. Now you, we knew it was coming, but we didn't know when. So I, I get the news that I'm going to be a father at the age of 19. And I get this uh, message, hey, you're going to Iraq. Three weeks. So the way I was raised, I, I did the right thing. I'd only been with this girl for less than two months. But I did the right thing. I married her, you know, and, and kind of changed the course of my life even further. So I went to Iraq, 18 months, saw things that I'll never forget, did things that um, you really shouldn't have to do in your life. And I knew that I wasn't going to get out. You know, um, the things that I saw, the things I was a part of, the way I felt about the work I was doing in my life, I knew I wasn't getting out of the Army. I would never admit that to anybody because I was always the guy, I'm getting out as soon as I can, but I knew I was staying in. I, I loved my job. I hated my unit. I, it was 2-6 Infantry, man. Go look it up. 2-6 <laughs> Infantry out of Bombholder, Germany, 1st Armored Division. Go look it up. It's a shit fest. It sucked. It sucked. The, the, the soldiers who were on the cover of Time Magazine in 2004, I believe, those were 1st AD soldiers. 1st Armored Division soldiers. And so it, it was a very important division during that entire war. And I, that's the only division I'd ever been in in my entire career. The entire... 10 years I was in the army. That's the division I was part of. I went to three different duty stations, three different posts, but always first armed division because I'm just a lucky guy. So, <laughs> so I knew I wasn't getting out. I knew that I, I end up after we get back from the first tour of Iraq, uh, I knew I had to get out of bomb holder. So I reenlist, I reenlist. And basically, that's I knew that was my big reenlistment because I reenlisted for five years. I was staying in Germany, uh, so that was it. So I stayed in Germany. I ended the plane again. Long story short, I know too late. I end up getting hurt, and I think about uh, all of this, especially on my last day, February twentieth, two thousand and ten, the day I retired from the United States Army. All of these thoughts are going into my head. You know, like I'm thinking about my entire career, every choice I ever made, anything that ever happened to me while I was in the army, the people that I'd meet, all of this stuff. But my mind always goes back to that day at 9-11, sitting at Nick at night, getting ready to run through courses, and then everybody finding out that everything has changed. Uh, it had quite an effect on me, and not only emotionally, physically, I mean, financially. I mean, every every way that you can be affected, it affected me. And I just wanted to do a video to kind of explain my story a little bit, to tell you a little bit more about my personal history with 9-11. And that's why every year that uh, goes by, I always make sure I take some time out and remember everything that happened on that day. Because even after a stroke, even after a decade, even after 14 years now, it's still in my head. Everything. Everything from that day. It was just, it's one of those things. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I don't know if that's the right word, but I appreciate you guys watching it. And I hope that you go into the comment section below and tell me where you were on 9-11 and what... What it did to you, uh, good or bad, don't don't worry about offending anybody. If I know that being patriotic or whatever at this point is not the the popular thing. I get that. And that's cool. But, you know, I love my country. I do. I always will. And that's it. So I don't regret anything 
that happened to me in the military. Good, bad, and indifferent. Yeah, uh, so there it is. Thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate it. Like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you next time right here on Dead on Day Productions. Take it easy. Peace.